Let's get started. This is the, uh, the Booking to Us uh, issue with Wireshark session. Uh, yeah, I'll give you um, a walkthrough about um, when, when you start with a particular use case, um, how you can, well, approach the US and debugging. Um, about me, I'm a Wireshark uh, contributor since 2013. Uh, I started working on the TOS sector and over time I got quite, uh, well, fixed quite a number of work in TOS and related sectors. I'm uh, mainly interested in the TOS sector, but from that point on I also go into HP, TCP, QUIC and so on. Uh, during night I'm hacking on Warshop, but during day I'm uh, part of the CloudTech crypto team in uh, London. So, um, the best way I guess to, to introduce to, to TOS de uh, decryption is um, look at a particular use case. When you encounter a certain bug, you always need... Um, the best way to uh, um, approach troubleshooting is to have a well-defined plan. In particular, you need uh, a way to reproduce it, a uh, description of what is going on, the environment that you uh, run, um, that you have the issue in, uh, the ex result you expect and the result you uh, actually see. That's basically exactly the same as reporting a bug uh, on the Wireshop bug tag example. In this example, uh, we had an issue where whenever you upload a file, uh, it would fail with a bad request. To reproduce this, we had to uh, select a file in a, a form, uh, modify the file, for example, uh, shrinking the packet capture, and finally uploading uh, this packet capture to a bug report. What, we, what I would expect is a new bug report with the packet capture attached. What actually happened is uh, a bad request, um, and this is particularly scary because usually, if something goes wrong, um, if you don't get a, like a white page, you get a nice error message uh, saying the origin's down or something like that. But th this indicates something <coughs> really, really bad. So, um, in order to debug this, I was like, okay, well, in Firefox or in Chrome, that's a Let's open up the web developer tools. It's a built-in feature of the application, uh, similar to um, if, for example, um, a web server has problems, you could inspect its, um, ex its uh, error box on the web server. On the client side, you can, for example, use the web developer tools. Um, since I suspected that this is a network issue, I uh, went to the network tab uh, in the uh, web developer tools and start, start the recording, refresh the page, uh, apply the step to reproduce. Uh, in this, this is how it should look like. Um, after a, 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 attaching your bug, you get the normal like, bug tracker, everything looks okay. Now com uh, compare this to the situation where it doesn't work. So here we get our uh, white page and interesting, we can already see a difference. Here we only have one request um, the, the, it somehow says it's zero gigabyte, where in the previous case we have a, a reasonable answer. Here we also see, for example, the remote server we were connecting to, a uh, successful status code, and the HP uh, version. And all of this is missing. So something is really wrong uh, in the application, but we cannot use the tools provided by the application, namely web developer tools, to investigate what is going on. So the second end is basically open up Wireshark, and we need to wait and need also need to plan to uh, uh, well to investigate this. Um, so based on the previous uh, working example, we know, okay, it's probably HP2 because it's at HP32 and it's also over TLS because we saw it's uh, using HTTPS. To uh, access the uh, HP request, which is an application layer protocol, we probably have to, um, but we, have, we have to capture the whole TLS session. Uh, why is that? The initial TOS handshake includes the uh, parameters and the, uh, the keys uh, in order to start an encrypted tunnel. Um, aside from aside from this initial handshake and all application, all all encrypted packets containing our HTTP two protocol, 
we also need some keys in order to uh, decrypt this session. So this is the basic idea. We have um, an application layer with HP2, which is written in an encrypted TLS session. So um, to do so, well, briefly we started the web developers in Firefox. Uh, now we have to start Wireshark and start Capture. Um, first, uh, after starting Wireshark, the first thing you have to do is select uh, an interface. Uh, this is, in this case, it's, um, I was connected to VPN, so it's a tunnel interface instead of uh, the, the like standard wireless adapter. This is also something you have to keep in mind. If you're capturing, uh, you have to know where your traffic is heading to. If you are connected to a VPN uh, and your wireless network at the same time, uh, and maybe like you have a virtual machine interface, um, the, the, your destination determines which of the interfaces you have to select. If you uh, are accessing something um, in your VM, capturing from your wireless interface will most likely not show anything. So uh, that's the first thing you have to get right. Be sure to like, select the interface. After that, you can optionally enter a, a capture filter. The purpose of this capture filter is to, to reduce the size of the capture filter uh, of the back capture that's being uh, like recorded. It's uh, different from the display filter in the sense that the capture filter it's like written to a temporary file. Uh, if you don't specify a capture filter, but use the display filter to um, to um, uh, filter your packets, you Wireshark still has to process a lot of data. So that's why it's a good idea to specify a capture filter. In this case. Uh, the, the application I was uh, analyzing, it was targeting uh, the Wireshark bug tracker, bug tracker, so I use host bug to Wireshark the dog. But you can also use something like port 53 for DNS, port 443 for, D, for uh, TLS, and so on. After selecting an uh, uh, interface entering a capture filter, you can start the capture by double clicking the, uh, the uh, um, interface name, which is press enter, or command E, or control E. Um, the syntax of this uh, uh, capture filter is documented in this uh, PCAP filter manual page and it's separate from this display filter. Um, so now, after that setup, we can finally record all, packet, uh, all packets, but now we still need the, the session secret in order to decrypt the session. Uh, in order to do so with uh, Firefox or Chrome, you have to set a, a special environment variable called the SLP log file. Um, or there's uh, also for Chrome and Firefox there are also like command line flags which you can use uh, to. Uh, sorry, um, with Chrome you can also set a particular command line flag to achieve the same. It's important to um, it, it's important to set this before starting Chrome or Firefox. Otherwise, uh, this application won't pick it up. Uh, these, um, this setting is only applied on, on startup. If you already have a, uh, an application running, it won't be able uh, to well, pick it up. It's basically ignored. Uh, well, no, I think it's a good time for a demonstration now. Uh, any questions so far? What's that? This, this setting of the SLK file uh, must be an absolute path, otherwise... Okay, so the comment was um, the SSL key of variable had to be an absolute path. Uh, yes, it's better to make it absolute because then it's not dependent on the current working directory. Yeah, it sometimes, it sometimes works. Oh, okay. 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 So basically what I'm doing now is I set the environment variable here and we'll start Firefox immediately. Um, I'm not sure if these codes are necessary, but we'll see. Okay, so first I have to start the packet capture. If I start uh, Firefox, 
if I start any application before starting packet capture, I will miss the TLS handshake and I won't be able to decrypt the, the traffic. The TLS handshake is essential in order to, uh, well, derive the, for Wireshark to derive the parameters that enable decryption. So let's capture from LAN and let's start. Firefox. Um, did this work? Probably not. Something look wrong. Oh, I think the code had to be removed. Okay. So, moved codes. Let's try it again. So now it works. Um, so yeah, the command cells in slide, basically I set an environment <coughs> variable to, uh, to the path on my desktop, a full every path, and then start Firefox. Now if I visit any website, for example, APS, uh, example.com, I can find it in Wireshark. Uh, for example, I don't know, IP dot load is example dot long. Oh wait, what? So in order to find my example dot com, I have to find use the filter as for a host name. This is typically in plain text, so that's why I'm still able to use this to uh, find uh, traffic. I would just use example.com. Now, I, this is the session I was looking for, based on this uh, SNI extension, the server name extension. Um, so what I did before, briefly, I tried to use uh, the IP.host uh, uh, filter, but that basically worked on the reverse um, DNS lookup of the IP address, which when, when you're using a shared web server or a CDN, it will definitely not match your uh, the, the same host name. So that's why I'm now using the uh, SNI extension to, to, to find my uh, uh, session. But I also, what I usually also find useful is uh, uh, to add this stream index as a column. The stream index identifies the uh, particular TCP connection. If you could create a new connection, it will have another um, connection number. Um, so if I now use yeah for TCP stream, yep, this will be the full the full um, well, TCP session containing my TLS transaction. So let me try to ignore uh, acknowledgement package I'm not interested in. Did you make it sex player? What's that? Did you make it sex player? The tech pick, oh sorry. So uh, yes. So what I said before, um, this is the TCP stream index. Uh, use the apply colon. And then you can quickly identify uh, which connection uh, you're looking at. Um, so as you can see, this this is a TLS handshake. Uh, in the client hello, it contains uh, parameters like what kind of ciphers the client supports and what server to connect to and what application protocols uh, the client would like to see, for example, HP or HP2. The server subsequently answers, uh, picks one of the uh, ciphers that the client requested. So here you can see it picked a particular cipher um, and basically a bunch of other things, including the application protocol. In this case, you can see it's uh, trying, it will use H2, H2 is HP2. This is uh, what um, makes it possible for servers to use HP2 instead of HP1. Typically when this uh, like parameter is not present, the server will assume HP1 over port 443. So after the uh, server, after server uh, agrees on the cryptographic parameters it's going to use, 
In TF 1.2, you'll see it uh, sends uh, the certificate, which the server can use to authenticate itself to the client. This is uh, uh, typically visible in your browser when you click the green padlock, it says uh, verified by, uh, I don't know, verified uh, or something like that, or let's encrypt that uh, certificate. And after that, yeah, the server sends its, um, well, uh, some, it sends its part of the key exchange, which allows uh, a key to be derived at the end. Uh, so after the, the client then basically does, does something similar, and after that, everything is encrypted. So this is usually what you see, and usually where you probably give up, like, oh, I can see and think, let's try to disable encryption. But there's a better way. You can enable, if you right click here on the TLS layer, you can go to protocol preferences and change, set the master secret log. And let's go to desktop where I have my key log file. Keys, open up. And now all traffic is decrypted, as you can see here, decrypted TLS. So this is a very powerful mechanism where you can uh, like look into Wireshark, uh, like uh, see the application data that was encrypted. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and this mechanism is basically supported by Firefox Chrome. Support for, for this feature depends uh, on on the uh, uh, TLS library. So um, NSS is used by Firefox. Um, Boring SSL or Open SSL is used by. Um, uh, by um, uh, Chrome, and those applications configure uh, the bit to, to dump this uh, keylog uh, uh, file. It's also supported by Chrome, so if you're on some server trying to reproduce something, very useful. It's uh, available in recent uh, version of Chrome. Uh, do note, if you're trying this out with Firefox on Debian or Ubuntu, it will uh, not work, because uh, those uh, systems disable this feature by default in the underlying TLS library. Uh, in order to use this on Debian or Ubuntu, you have to use the official Firefox build from the, Mo uh, from the Mozilla website. Uh, yeah. What's it? Oh. Sorry, one quick question. Does this uh, encryption based on this uh, key log file also work for TLS 1.3? Yes. So, if you have a look at, uh, if you actually open up the key log file, you'll see uh, a number of uh, text lines, uh, some kind of label, followed by some kind of identifier, followed by another bunch of random gibberish. This might make no sense to you, but this is the first key is typically the uh, uh, value from the client hello, like the random field from the client hello. The second field is the secret that's associated with, uh, with this identifier. In TLS 1.2, it's, al it's always a mapping, uh, it's called client random. What it basically does is maps the client random to mass the secret. In TLS 1.3, this uh, key format was updated, but instead of a single key, now we need uh, a bunch of uh, additional keys, uh, because the TLS 1.3 key schedule has complicated, like, it is a bit more uh, complicated. Um, I'll get back to that later. Um, the TLS 1.3, um, so in TLS 1.2, uh, the, the, uh, you, you, was, you were able to see the certificate, you were able to see uh, the like client hello, and all of these were in uh, plain text. Only the application data was encrypted. In TLS 1.3, the client hello and server hello are still encrypted, but uh, uh, part of the uh, extension from the server hello, for example, the uh, application and layer protocol that has to be used is moved to an encrypted uh, extensions uh, uh, message. And so part, so the beginning is still in plain text. Then part of the handshake is encrypted. That includes the certificate. That includes the uh, whether HP2 should be used or not. And after that, uh, the application data follows. So that's why uh, that's why you see uh, cl uh, client hand tr handshake traffic secret and server handshake traffic secret. These are the secrets that are uh, used to decrypt the encrypted handshake in TLS 1.3. In TLS 1.2, all of these were still uh, like in plain text. Um, so yeah, um, when you set this uh, 
this option to write a file, it's a good idea to check whether the file was written or not. So briefly you saw that I expected this file to be created, it didn't work. That was because I had accidentally added quotes which was apparently not uh, liked by uh, Windows. So yeah, so I showed you how to configure it in Wireshark. You can also set this uh, via the uh, com command line option, a ts.elog file. Uh, this works also with uh, Wireshark, not just uh, T-Shark. Uh, yeah, then you can well pass in the capture. So uh, after setting this um, the correct key and the correct capture, I'm, I was able to look into that uh, 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 that broken Firefox. Uh, in that particular case, uh, it turned out that the the body the body that was included with uh, the HP uh, request. Uh, had a different length than was advertised. So it, that was indeed a, a bad request from the client side and that was why uh, the, like the server was just uh, rejecting it. Uh, so in this case you can also clearly see uh, well, so th this is a TIOS 1.3 mesh and you can also see decrypting work with TIOS 1.3. Uh, different between TIOS 1.3 and 1.2 is uh, in particular there's one round trip less. So the, in, in TS 1.2 trace, you saw the client hello first and serve hello from the, from uh, the server, and then the client had to send another like a key exchange message, and the server had to respond with finished, as you could see here. So the client sent the client hello server. And this, these are all messages from the server. Then the client has to send a message um, finished before. Let's see. Actually, this is probably 1.3. No, 1.2. <coughs> okay. Oh, by the way, uh, let's see. I'll show you how you can recognize just 1.3 and 1.2, how that works. So uh, TS 1.3 had shown, uh, was I think maybe about to be released two years ago, but at some point uh, they found a, a lot of uh, uh, like connection that would just fail due to like inspection boxes or whatever, uh, middle boxes basically. Um, turned out that uh, the, ver the earlier draft version that was attempted to, be, uh, to get deployed didn't, um, well, um, caused failures because the middle boxes weren't exactly expecting uh, uh, like the advertised versions and so on. Let's see. Um, I'm trying to locate the OS one point three trace. just one be three recognized. If you look at the capture, there are, the client hello has uh, two versions. It has this like record version, and there's a, a client another version in the uh, client hello handshake message. Both of them, well, do not exactly say just one point three as you can see. Typically, this uh, record in earlier just uh, versions, this version meant. Uh, the minimum version that's supported by uh, the, th that's supported by the client, and this would be the maximum uh, version that's supported by the client. When uh, uh, like implement the, uh, when the ITF tried to use this for for advertising just one point three, like things broke. So that's why it still says one point two, even in just one point three. Instead, just one point three used this, uh, a special extension called supported version. It advertised like the number of versions that uh, the client supports. This way, a, a server that doesn't recognize this extension will be free to ignore this and uh, negotiate 1.2 without, 
for our breaking existing deployment. On the server side, you can also see that the version is still 1.2. Um, this is, um, again, for compatibility with Smitterbox and not to break anything, and the actual uh, version is included in the supported versions extension. This is also how Wireshark uh, decides whether to advertise <coughs> TOS 1.3 here, uh, or 1.2 or other version. Um, yeah. uh, so, let's see all the changes. Oh, yeah. So, briefly, I uh, created this key, key file, but it's a bit annoying if you have a lot of capture files and want to share your uh, keys with others, that everyone would basically have to uh, continuously change that uh, particular uh, preference if they change uh, 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 the capture file and have uh, the keys in separate files. A new feature in Wireshark 3.0 is uh, 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 the, the, uh, the ability to embed TOS secrets in uh, a PCAP and G file. It doesn't work with plain uh, PCAP files because it is not that extensible, but the PCAP and G file is able to store uh, this uh, key. This feature is uh, like internally it's called the DSP, which stands for Decryption Secrets uh, Block. So if you were like pay, uh, looking carefully, the previous file I used also had DSP in the file name, which is the convention I use uh, to indicate that secrets are stored in a file. Um, you can uh, add, uh, add uh, keys to an existing file using the edit cap dash dash inject dash secrets option. Uh, specify that the keys uh, are in fact for TOS and input output. Um, to, re to remove uh, or remove secrets, you can also use the discard all secrets uh, option, uh, and replacing is combining the two. Uh, since like it's very common that you basically that you're given a key file, uh, sort of the, like the keylog file and capture file, um, and you probably don't want to remember our options. I also made the convenience uh, shell script, which uh, uh, takes this uh, um, keylog file and capture file and will write some uh, DSP to pick up NG. Um, additionally, what this shell script does, it's, uh, it uses T Shark. It uses uh, T Shark. To, um, uh, to limit, I oh, hope you can read a bit. It uses t to, to uh, extract um, uh, the client random field from the packet capture and then uh, limits the kilo file just to the secret that's necessary for this uh, session. So even if you have a very, if you continuously like uh, log all secret and, and maybe it includes say the keys for your uh, like for your email or whatever, um, this uh, script will basically discard uh, those if you're, for example, only focusing on example com or whatever app is you are investigating. Yeah, and at the end, then basically you get a single packet capture file uh, with uh, the, the secrets in question. And if you um, if you want to audit your packet and uh, your pickup and G file before distributing it, for example, there's also uh, an option for that. So this trace has keys because I didn't specify any option, but I'm still able to decrypt that. If you go to uh, view. There's a reload as file format capture option. If you click on that, you will get the, uh, uh, the like the raw the internal representation, like the file, uh, the section of the pcap and g file, and you will see the decryption secret block in there, and basically a, a, a number of like text uh, files. So this way, if you really want to be sure that you're not accidentally adding too much data to a capture that you're going to share with the external party, uh, you could use it uh, for, uh, to verify this. Again, it's uh, edit, sorry, view, uh, reload as a file for one capture. Um, so, uh, 
uh, before this, uh, before uh, the kilo file I showed you, you might have uh, thought about another approach uh, for for uh, GLAS decryption, which is using an uh, RSA key, a private key. Um, this was uh, that approach was much more popular in the past um, because you only have to configure a private uh, RSA private key in Wireshark once. Uh, and then it will be able to decrypt pretty much all GIS traffic from that server, uh, almost. Um, yeah, the advantage you have to specify it only once, and then you can decrypt all traffic. There are some limitations, though. Um, if you are controlling the client, and you are trying to use uh, an API from, I don't know, Amazon, for example, they will most likely not be willing to give you their private keys. So in that case, you won't be able to decrypt the traffic to a third party for, for which you don't have the private key. It's uh, not a problem. It's, it doesn't work with uh, forward six ciphers, uh, ciphers that use the Tithian key exchange. In TOS, there are two uh, key exchange uh, algorithms. There's RSA, and in the case of RSA, basically the client generates uh, some random value called the pre-master secret. And this brief master secret is subsequently encrypted with the uh, 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 public key in the certificate provided by the server. So if you remember from before, the server sent a certificate. In the case of RSA key exchange, the client will encrypt uh, the pre master secret with information from that certificate, which allows the server to decrypt it again and obtain the same pre master secret. Uh, that's the RSA key exchange, and that's how they both achieve the same session secret. With uh, the Diffie-Helm key exchange, um, it uses some, um, well, some mod where both parties uh, provide the key share. So everyone looking at the, the, those key shares will, will, will still, still not be able to, uh, to find the key that was agreed on. But by mod, uh, both parties will be able to uh, arrive at the same session secret. Um, but yeah, that means with just a passive uh, capture, you won't be able to decrypt those traces. And that's why the key lock file uh, is pre uh, preferred, because that always works independent of whether it's R the RSA key exchange or um, the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Another problem is it doesn't work with session resumption. So with session resumption, the uh, uh, client basically sends uh, the first time the, the client connects with the server, the server will send some kind of identifier or a, a session ticket back. A session ticket basically is some kind of opaque uh, structure that the client can uh, send in the next session. So in the first session, the client uh, gets a session ID or session ticket back from the server and will remember what kind of secret it, uh, what kind of session secret it used. In the next uh, uh, connection, the second connection, it will send the session ID again, or the session ticket again. And if the server um, uh, uh, like remembers that it's like sent this session ticket or ID before, it will just skip the key exchange and uh, go straight into encrypting the whole uh, session with the keys that were agreed on before. A problem with that is, since our, the RSA key exchange requires this certificate to be sent, uh, and it requires the client to send the key in encrypted form. With session resumption, this, uh, like, uh, sending the encrypted uh, key back is skipped. So that's why uh, session resumption doesn't work. Uh, like, that's why you can't decrypt uh, uh, um, sessions that use session resumption uh, you and the RSA key exchange. Uh, another problem is that it doesn't work with TS 1.3 at all. With TS 1.3, the RSA key exchange has completely been removed. You cannot uh, use that. Um, but yeah, yeah. And so the danger: if you ever accidentally uh, leak this key, then you will compromise all previous traffic and all future traffic. That's why it's called why RSA is not called uh, forward secret. So. Besides this limitation, I mean, if you are only running a development server and uh, don't want to cap, don't have the ability to get this the key, the session keys using key log file method, uh, you can still, for example, force the server to the server or the client to use the RSA uh, key exchange only with just 1.2 or earlier. 
And if you do so, you can uh, configure in Wireshark as follows. So uh, Wireshark has like multiple options to configure the RSA key file, but since 3.0 has been basically consolidated one like hopefully simpler user interface. If you go to preferences, there's an RSA keys option where you only have to click add new key file, select your RSA private key file, and enter password if necessary. If you, uh, there's no password, Wireshark won't prompt you for a password. So that's why this interface should be preferred over the old interface uh, which was present in the uh, GS preferences. Um, this, also, this interface also uh, works with um, a certain HSM which support the PKCS11 uh, uh, API standard. Um, but that, that has not like been tested uh, very well apart from like a software implementation. If you need this kind of support, like contact uh, contact us, uh, and we can try to work on getting it uh, up working. <laughs> Um, some I other issues you may run into, if your session is, um, uh, if your uh, TCP stream contains a segment that are out of order, that might break decryption. Um, why should, like decryption requires also segment to be uh, received in, in, in the order. Um, a way to confirm. If you run into this situation, you'll see, okay, there are some TOS-related messages, you will maybe see TCP preview segment not captured and TCP out of order and then ignored a no record, for example. This indicates that you have a problem with out of order packets. To fix this, go to the pro TCP protocol preferences. For example, right click there, protocol preferences, and enable the reassemble out of uh, order segments option. That will ensure that uh, if this situation is reached, it will internally try to reorder and well fix decryption for you. Um, the reason why it's disabled is well, if you have uh, wireless 802.11 capture and some parts are missing, uh, this feature will basically uh, make it impossible to reassemble uh, like the um, application data in those capture in those uh, kind of captures. So while this fixes it for uh, applications, for people who are only looking at the application layer, it might, this option might break uh, the analysis if you're looking at 802.11, for example. But uh, if you're doing any kind of application layer analysis, I recommend you just to like always enable this option, reassemble out of order segments. Um, And yeah, if you want to play with this uh, sample, it's uh, on our website by Google. Uh, another problem that existed in the past was uh, large certificates were not properly displayed. Well, in fact, it still exists in the stable version. Um, if, if you have, um, in a TIS handshake, um, TIS works with records where messages are like split up in small part and basically encapsulated in a record. If you have a fairly large certificate with a lot of like uh, names uh, or a very long list of um, certificate authorities, it might not fit in a single TIS record. Or it might, uh, yeah, it might not fit in a single TIS record. So in that case, the TIS implementation might decide to split it up in multiple TIS records. Uh, and in the past, Wireshark didn't handle that correctly, and you would see encrypted handshake message, even if you have the, uh, uh, the decryption secret, for example. If you run into this situation, um, well, if you were using 3.0 before, just, to be, just beware of this problem. It will be fixed with the next version, where uh, certificates are properly reassembled. Um, yeah. And that will also fix TIOS one decrypt decryption, for example, if you have large certificates. If you're using uh, TIOS on custom ports, uh, usually Wireshark will be able to detect this. Um, this, <laughs> yeah, so, 
in, in Basque there was uh, like a, a, the group packet uh, competition and that was basically the first version where uh, this uh, feature was added and but there was still work in that version where the client had the just sorry SL 2.0 client header was not properly recognized and which broke uh, the grip at the time uh, but that was basically the well, the first version where this uh, feature was added, uh, TLS heuristics basically. If if uh, it's not recognized because you are running TLS over port, I don't know, 8080 or some other protocol which is normally used by a different uh, uh, protocol, you can use the decode uh, as functionalities to set an explicit protocol. There are two parts for this. There's the TCP layer. Of course, you have to tell TCP that it's actually uh, TLS that you're looking at, and there's the application layer protocol. So if you remember from the beginning, the, client, the uh, server hello included this application uh, uh, layer protocol and uh, a negotiation extension, but if that's not present, you and you would have to explicitly specify that it's, for example, SMTP or it's HTTP, and you can do that with this decode S dialog. Um, okay. To get to this place, yeah, basically right click on the right layer, decode S, and you get this dialog where you can change settings. And yeah, this one is probably easy to see. Note that there are also some protocols that start with a plain text negotiation. For example, uh, SMTP uh, or IMAP or uh, or like I believe Postgres. They start with a, a protocol specific negotiation where the client, for example, first asks, like, hey, do you support TOS? And the server then responds with, well, I support TOS. And then the client will say, like, okay, carry on. Well, let's use TOS from this point on. In order to properly um, like make Wireshark analyze these traces, you make sure that uh, you um, select uh, the original protocol, for example, SMTP, instead of TOS. Otherwise, the first part will not properly be recognized. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is basically the most, like the well, the essential information you have to uh, know for a TOS decryption. Are there any questions to the points? Yeah, for the uh, two files, uh, as the process, uh, every start of the browser really so that was uh, if you have this key log file and farm variable, mm -hmm. uh, and you start, uh, will the browser uh, uh, like create a new file node? The answer is the browser will typically it will append to the existing file. So be sure to uh, disable this environment variable if you're done with debugging. Okay. Otherwise, your key log file may grow enormously. Yeah, because then this would be my next question. <coughs> for example, if you have the, the keylog file for weeks on, on some uh, machine, then you have probably thousands of entries there, and it might be performance wise also a problem if you yeah. uh, put this, this big keylog file uh, to Wireshark to some bigger trace, maybe. I don't know how internally the, okay. the entries are assigned to the correct sessions in the, in the yeah. if you find it might be performance. Inter internally, the keylog file is loaded in a, like a hash table by Wireshark, so it doesn't have to do a linear scan, it can do I think log n or something. Uh, so it's like even if your keylog file is very big, Wireshark should, should still be uh, have no issue uh, like identifying the keys that belong to it. There was a bug though on Windows only, where every time it uh, reaches this uh, reach the OS packet, it would basically rescan the whole file. But by now that's fixed. That should have been fixed uh, very recently. Uh, and also Windows only. So if you using, were using Mac or Linux, you you were fine. Um, are this, this keylog file feature also uh, existing on mobile devices? So <coughs> yeah, the question was whether the keylog file exists on mobile devices. Uh, not really. If you're using, uh, if you're trying to analyze mobile devices, there are various approaches. Um, well, either you could. Um, the, in theory, you could use the key log file mechanism on mobile devices, but it's not easy, and you probably have to fiddle a bit with the debugger or 
like uh, set up a special environment for it. Usually what I did for, uh, in order to do, analyze the ice traces on, for example, Android, I, I basically set up an access point on my laptop on which I ran a midden proxy and then uh, basically int uh, for, um, uses like IP tables to forward all traffic to the midden proxy. Uh, that meant that I had to use a, uh, like, install a custom root certificate on the Android phone in order to inset the traffic. Uh, the problem with that approach is uh, if, the client, if the Android app does uh, certificate pinning, for example, uh, it will probably break. And using any kind of uh, a man in the middle uh, has the disadvantage that it modifies application like it's observable to the application. So if you are investigating some kind of problem, Using a, a man in middle proxy uh, can like make that problem go away. So once you start debugging, it's, the environment is all of a sudden different. That's why I prefer the uh, keylog uh, file mechanism for uh, analyzing TLS traces, because then you basically have exactly a forensic a trace of what exactly what's going on, plus the keys in order to understand the trace. So, but the summary is that the keylog approach is limited to Windows and. Uh, you have to Chrome and Firefox browsers. So um, I gave a Windows, and, and uh, so the question was uh, whether this approach was limited to uh, Firefox and Chrome. Uh, no, I just gave this example because it's very easy to relate to, and people that are doing like debugging in on the application layer uh, will probably be able to use this with Chrome, for example, and Firefox Chrome. This uh, like format is very like gener generic, so any application that can is able to produce these secrets will be able to decrypt just traces. In fact, there are I don't know of at least two vendors who will use this uh, format um, for their like well uh, um, in TIOS inspection uh, appliances. Um, the Mitten proxy tool I mentioned before is also like an open source uh, uh, thing and also supports this SO keylog file mechanism. Um, note that in this case, uh, um, the SO keylog file is a specific implementation that uh, is activated by setting an environment variable. But you, if you like control the DLS uh, library or if you have, you know, have a virtual machine where you can um, uh, get the secret from memory, you can reuse the same file format. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let me go into another example. So, uh, in, in the past, uh, when you connect it to a website in your browser, your browser would typically use uh, DNS in order to learn the, the IP it has to connect to. It will use uh, TLS to, well, uh, well, to establish a secure channel and uh, include the destination in the TLS server name extension. And, and after that, there will be an HTTP method where the uh, server is again include a host header. Um, things have changed in, uh, over time. Now we are using well, still DNS, and we still have TOS 1.3, and we're using HTTP 2, for example. Let's have a look at, uh, let's see, an example. now is uh, a new draft standard which is still being developed. It's not like finalized yet, uh, but this idea will evolve, but will probably be present in the future. It's called the ES9, encrypted S9. So previously you were pretty sure that you can use the server name extension. Let me try to find it in order to find a server name in plain text. 
with ESNI, this uh, uh, server name will be encrypted and won't be visible anymore. But how does this exactly work? First, uh, depending on the implementation, um, for encrypted ESNI to work, you first need a key in order to encrypt the server name. Um, this key is also uh, in current uh, version of ES9, it also used a, this like Divi uh, approach, which is similar to the Tiofsky exchange, in order to derive a secret that can be used to encrypt ES9. So basically, you need um, a key from something, a key that the server also knows, in order to encrypt this. Uh, cur currently, it's distributed over DNS. Uh, one of the like um, mo motivation for for ES9 is to increase uh, privacy. So anyone who looks just at network traces should not be able to learn that you're trying to contact uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Facebook or, or eBay or whatever you site you're visiting or some kind of news website. Um, ES9 uh, co conceals this, but it only works if uh, if no one else other than the server is able to decrypt this. And uh, if every server uses like the same key, sorry, uses a different key for individual host, then you will still be able to, uh, uh, based on the key, public key that was used, you would still be able to tell how oh, this public key is always mapping to uh, Facebook, account, for example. So that's why um, for ESNI it works best if you have some kind of anonymity set where the same uh, public key is reused among a set of uh, serve names. Um, so that's a bit of an easy night. If so, if you want to protect, uh, like, get this, like, the serve keys to the client somehow, uh, currently it's using DNS for that. Um, but as you might know, DNS is usually in plain text and, uh, well, it can also be, like, uh, change, it can be removed, uh, and if it, someone can easily like change DNS, then they could also disable ESNI. Currently ESNI is um, basically falling back. If the server doesn't support ESNI, uh, if there are no keys available for ESNI, the, the client will typically just fall back to using plain text SNI. Uh, so that's why um, the, initial, the first experiment in Firefox, they used um, uh, encrypted the DNS transport called DNS over D, uh, HPS. How does that work? So how does that work? Let's see. Not this field. DNS or TOS. So in what Firefox did at first is first uh, try to like query the, the uh, DNS over the HPS server in order to learn the IP address to connect to. After that, it connects to that uh, IP address that was um, uh, well from the DNS request. And I will now also add the like TCP stream so you can see which connection it belongs to. So here we have the DNS query in order to see what DNS server to connect to, and now we also have the uh, DNS. Oh, sorry, we have the um, TLS session to the DNS of HPS server. And how uh, DNS of HPS works is basically like, yeah, typical uh, like HP APIs. You have some, like some headers. In this case, you're trying to send a post request to DNS query and you specify that the uh, application type is, well, a DNS message, and following that, the server, let's see, the server will reply with a, a DNS query response. There you go. So yeah. And the headers belong this, yeah, it's all set like, okay, come type, it's a DNS message. So this is basically how DNS over HPS works. Uh, first try to figure out what kind of DNS server to use uh, that support DNS over HPS, connect to it and send a query of it, and well, that way the DNS message will be protected. Um, 
strong people found that uh, uh, let's forget about that part. Um, so, so let's see. I can tell you now like how he is now work, but this, this basically changed in the latest draft version. Uh, right in, in current uh, version that deployed in Python in Cloudflare, they use uh, a special underscore ESNI dot Cloudflare text record, which contains uh, the uh, DNS keys, which can allow Firefox to connect uh, to a server using ESNI. So after this query, we will see, we can try to find the connect TOS connection that uses SNI. Uh, hope maybe it's this one. No, because we still have. So let's try to find the dot extension dot. Don't know encrypted. TOS dot handshake dot extension and. Okay, I don't know the field by knit by heart, so I'll just find it through G-Shock. ES9 maybe. GS dot ES9. Okay, so it's actually called GS dot ES9. So yeah, here we have example. Let's try to follow this stream. So this is an uh, example of a, a connection that uses uh, uh, ESNI. Um, that is, there's like a bunch of data that's like all encrypted. You can't see anything on the wire that indicates that it's using a particular website. Um, but since we have the like the kiosk keys, we can now look inside inside the thing. Um, oh yeah, the server now acknowledges it through the ESNI extension as well, but that will change in later version of the standard. Uh, but if you now look inside, uh, see this. Now we have the certificate as well, but this again encrypted. So that's also a reason why this ESNI standard, the encrypt ESNI standard, only uh, well basically requires TF 1.3. Because in case if if this was implemented for 1.2, anyone could basically look at the certificate and learn the server name and use, which basically defeats the purpose of ESNI. So that's why ESNI requires TF 1.3. Uh, yeah. So now we can learn that we will probably connect to cloudflare.com or something else, or we better have a look at the actual HP transaction that contains an authority section. So actually, I was trying to connect to www.pavlet.com instead of pavlet.com itself. But yeah, that's how ESNI works. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ES9 is of subject to change. Um, Chrome is working on adding support for the latest draft version, but it's not there yet. In maybe next year it will be fine. I will see. Um, DNS of HPS it is a final standard um, and it's already being deployed. Uh, I believe in uh, uh, the US, uh, Firefox is trying to roll this out by default. Um, there has been some controversy of it, uh, because network administrators might not be very happy that uh, DNS traffic all of a sudden go uh, to an invisible point. So that's why Firefox also provides like, options to disable it in enterprise uh, deployments. Uh, it, an interesting um, observation is that there's just a p p potential choice for deployment. Chrome, for example, they uh, they, can, they, they also support uh, DOH, uh, I think still like, experimentally, in the latest Chrome, I believe it was Chrome 70 or so. Uh, if, there, if the local, local config, locally configured DNS so, uh, server support DOH, uh, then it will try to connect to that server and use it. So that, that shows that DOH is just like a protocol, 
but how it deployed it fed it fair eyes. Um, something similar to DOH is uh, DOD DNS over TOS. It's again like encrypted uh, encrypted uh, DNS, and um, th this is used on Android, for example. On Android, uh, the latest version of Android there's a feature called private DNS, and by default it's using an opportunistic upgrade. So if the local uh, locally advertised DNS sub supports DNS over TOS, uh, which is on port 853, then it will try to use that, and otherwise it will fall back to plain text DNS. Um, yeah. So yeah, like I said before, uh, DOH uh, encrypted server name. Um, sorry, ES9 encrypted the server name in TLS, and DOH ensured that the echo DNS uh, query itself was also encrypted. Otherwise, you could just look at DNS and guess that the next uh, connection will most likely be one of the names that you just requested. And TLS 1.3 indeed encrypt the server certificate, so you can also not load the server name in that way, and ESNI indeed hide it from TLS. So that way, if you follow the TCP stream or just look at the trace, you won't be able to tell the server name that was connected to, except for maybe guessing on information like the IP address. Uh, yeah. Another, another. Uh, standard that's upcoming is uh, um, a quick, uh, well, current route is in fact 24, but anyway, it, it still uses TOS 1.3 for security. Uh, quick is a transport protocol, and on top of that, there will be HP3. Um, what is the difference between HP1, HP2, HP3? HP1 was basically you have a request, you, s you send a request, maybe you send another request directly after it. But then you basically have to wait for the server to send a complete response uh, uh, before it gets the next response for the second request. It be, um, if you have a, like a lot of resources, um, that basically means a that um, you won't get the, the response for the last request, even if you really want that request uh, faster um, than the request you sent before. HP2 solves this problem by introducing the concept of streams. So then you have uh, a single TCP stream with m multiple uh, streams. Uh, you can see it here. So this is the stream number, and this is a single TCP connection. Here you can see there's a single, uh, there are like a bunch of uh, requests over very different streams, and the server can basically respond with uh, partial data in any order because the data is included in separate frames. So you can see that right there. Every stream has a like, so-called data frame, and uh, the, the, the like, part of the response can be split in multiple frames, and be, be the frame, the, basically the response can be returned in any order. Um, so yeah, basically improved parallelism. Uh, the problem with this feature is that um, it's still based on TCP, and TCP provides um, uh, a guarantee that the data is always delivered in order to the application. So if you have bad network conditions and data get lost, um, everything up from that point on will basically be blocked and until that uh, single uh, lost data is uh, retransmitted. So even if you already have like complete, if the lost uh, stream is, for example, stream one, and you have like stream two, three, and four, which are already complete received, the application cannot process them until it gets uh, like stream one again, which is a shame. It's called the head of line blocking problem, and that is finally solved with uh, uh, using uh, HP three with uh, uh, Quick as transport. Quick is based on UDP. Uh, so it doesn't have it can return data in any order. Oh, can I show you an example of how that uh, looks like? So again, DSP I already included the uh, the the, uh, the script secret for this. So of course, you still have like the familiar. Uh, uh, DNS query. 
true about that. Um, yeah, you can ignore this. So. Yes. In Quick, there's some. Yeah. This is still subject to change, but right now in Quick, if you send a, a, like, like a protocol negotiation, protocol negotiation in Quick is not uh, like complete done yet. So remember in TLS one, uh, TLS pass, we have like problems deploying newer versions of the protocol uh, because uh, well, uh, the pro the message was pretty much always the same, and um, so Midbox started to rely making certain assumptions which were not actually specified in the standards, which makes future evolution of the uh, protocol harder. So that that's why in Quick by default. Uh, the whole message is encrypted, uh, dependent on, and that's dependent on uh, parameters. Uh, well, from the specification, if you if a uh, recipient is not able to understand the request, it can send um, like version negotiation back and back with the version that are actually supported. For example, this specified in support draft twenty three. And then this, 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 the client can send a new request using this version. And as you can see here, it says decrypted quick. And this is the client hello, which now also encrypted. You may ask, what key does it use? This key is actually like fixed. It doesn't provide uh, confidentiality. It just makes it harder for minimum <coughs> inspection. Boxes to do, do, no, basically do like a crab, do, do a substring search on the uh, packet and break, uh, make it harder to, uh, to change the protocol later. So uh, here you can also see there's like some t uh, quick specific header and the TLS is embedded inside quick. So the cryptographic handshake is, uh, ex is exactly the same as TLS 1.3. And after this handshake, We'll have uh, uh, actual uh, the application data, and this also is based on TLS 1.3 uh, in the sense that it used the same uh, uh, like uh, session keys. So that's also why you can reuse the kilo file mechanism to decrypt quick traces. Uh, Wireshark doesn't support the uh, HP3 yet, but uh, um, I'm working on it. Uh, eventually, you should, should be able to see HP3 uh, in Quick Trace as well. Uh, and yeah, Quick is currently supported by uh, Google has Google Quick support, and they are working on IDF uh, Quick support as well. Uh, oh, by the way, some background information: Google started first with uh, the Quick protocol, uh, and then brought it to the IDF working group to basically make it a, a stand, an open standard where like multiple parts can provide the input to. Uh, and that's currently being uh, implemented by Cloudflare, for example, and there, uh, like, there's like a whole bunch of list of implementation for it. But it is still being uh, developed. Uh, so that's uh, what you can expect in the future. Uh, yeah, as conclusion, um, we saw how you can use a kilo file decryption uh, to a kilo file to enable decryption in Wireshark and why it's pre preferable over RSA keys. Uh, you, you can use the add cap command or the shell script uh, link before uh, for easier distribution of uh, uh, traces with decryption enabled. And always enable like the TCP reassembly preferences, enable uh, out of order. Um, uh, reassembly to well basically make the decryption work as much as possible. Uh, what I skipped from this part is like a completely walk through to the uh, the uh, uh, handshake protocol uh, and how you can get the secret for different applications. For example, um, yeah, Windows or something. Uh, and that those uh, uh, that information is uh, basically in this uh, slide. Uh, any questions? I would have one question to the encryption of the SNI and the certificate uh, for TLS 1.3. How does this technically work? 
because we said that the, the key for encrypting SNI and for the for the service that comes from the DNS. So this means the client and the server uh, both must have the same key so that the client, for example, can decrypt the certificate coming from the server and the SNI can be decrypted on the server side coming from the client, right? <coughs> so so yeah. does the server uh, also a DNS query to get the, the no. same key? So um, the question was uh, like uh, the, cli the client and server have to use the same uh, key and the client get a key from DNS. Uh, how does the server like? No, key, yes. How is the server able to use the key? <coughs> uh, yeah, the, the server and the key, the DNS, uh, the keys from the DNS server and the keys on the server have to be synchronized in some way. Uh, so it definitely needs some kind of automated uh, like system to like. To, in order to be able to free, frequently roll the key, uh, this is uh, like yeah, this is typically done by like it's typically very easy for larger deployment, larger like CDNs and so on. Uh, but yeah, because because I, as example, for, uh, if I'm using TLS 1.3 for connecting to Facebook, for example, so I understood that uh, by using a, a domain uh, name server. Uh, supporting this, I could ask for facebook.com and I'm getting the key uh, for uh, my uh, SNI uh, encryption there as client. And the server uh, must use the same key for yes. encrypting the server. So the server and the DS so server have to use the server is the central point for both of them to get to the same key. That, that was my, my original question. <coughs> uh, the question is whether the DNS server and the server have the same keys or? Yeah, the, the key, if they are um, getting both their key for encrypting the server certificate and the CNI, uh, SNI, uh, if they are getting this key both from the. Uh, no, 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 okay, okay, okay. Uh, small misunderstanding. So the question is whether the uh, certificate and the ES, uh, like as now is encrypted by the same key. Yes. Uh, the answer is no. The uh, the server is encrypted by the handshake uh, secret, uh, which is like part of uh, the TLS key exchange. Uh, so TLS uh, in TLS one point three, the very first method includes uh, like one particular key share, one different key share. The server will also send back a key share, but uh, the, the result of this. Uh, well, can be used to encrypt the handshake, mm -hmm. and this is used to uh, to encrypt the certificate as well. But that is separate from the uh, the key that is used to encrypt SNI. The key encrypt to SNI is basically this like same uh, DVM key exchange, but then it it really a second one instead of between the client and the server, it's between the client and the key that was from the DNS server. Oh. And uh, this first part for the certificate, we saw in the keynote file. For the, for the, uh, in order to see the uh, yeah. certificate, yes. In order to decrypt the certificate, uh, you need the uh, server handshake traffic secret in the key of file. Okay. It's the <coughs> yeah, this one, the server handshake traffic secret. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any others? All right. Okay. Thank you.